Hello, everybody. My name is Arielle, and I create neurotechnology tools. We just heard about neurotechnology in clinical and hospital settings. But neurotech is not new, and it is not just for the few. In fact, in 2014, you could buy this, a brain-sensing headband in Best Buy. This is Muse. It's a clinical-grade EEG. It has four channels of EEG data and was designed for easy use and access by the average person. For the last decade, we've been making clinical-grade EEGs designed for consumers to use in their own homes in a variety of use cases with scientific rigor and data governance at the forefront. So EEG used to only be accessible in a research lab or a hospital. You'd go in and you'd have a clinician fix EEG on your head with wet prep gunk. A wire would go across the room. It would take about 45 minutes to get good signal quality, at which point a computer on the other side of the room would record your data and somebody else would interpret it. Now, you can access and make use of clinical grade EEG technology in your own home, in a simple to use form factor, and get good signal quality in three minutes. And then you're able to see your own data on your phone right in your own hand. Our aim with this technology is to improve brain health, which includes both cognitive as well as mental health. We measure your brain activity and then provide you with metrics on your brain's activity and create applications that are designed to improve your brain health. Our very first brain health use case was meditation. So we all know meditation's good for you, right? Who here knows they should be meditating? But meditation is very hard to do. You sit there, you're not quite sure what's supposed to be going on in your mind, and so you become frustrated and stop. Well, with Muse, we realized we could solve that problem by actually giving you real-time feedback on what your brain was doing during your meditation, helping you actually know when you were focused in the meditation state and guiding your brain there. This proved to be incredibly useful at helping people either start their meditation practice or enhance an existing practice. And to give you a sense of the scope and scale, around half a million people have meditated with Muse. And it's also been validated in studies to be effective at improving outcomes in populations like office workers, healthcare professionals, students, cancer patients, and more. The next task we took on was the creation of Muse S, which was specifically for sleep and widely available to consumers. It can track and score your sleep in real time. Now, this allows for features that help you improve your sleep, like the digital sleeping pill. With the digital sleeping pill, you listen to audio as you're falling asleep, and as you begin to move from wakefulness right into N1, the Muse detects the change and begins to quiet the audio, thereby guiding your brain into sleep. And once you're asleep, it turns the audio on. If you happen to wake up in the night, a problem many people have, Muse wakes up with you, detects your change in brain state, and brings back in the same audio intervention that helped you fall asleep the first time. Now, it can do this all quite effectively because Muse can track your sleep EEG as effectively as a sleep lab. It's been validated to do so. But instead of going into the unnatural environment as a sleep lab, for a single night's sleep, Muse tracks your sleep night after night, comfortably in your own bed, for a tiny fraction of the cost. And as a result, Muse is now being widely used by researchers for at-home sleep studies. Researchers like the Canadian Sleep Consortium, who are using Muse in studies on insomnia and depression. And this is really opening up access to looking at the sleeping brain at a large scale in the home, and this also allows us to do distributed sleep science, accessing populations that wouldn't necessarily be able to come into a sleep lab, like our collaboration on the California Sleep Medi Precision Medicine Initiative, where we're tracking sleep and EEG of 800 sexual minority youth, the work that the Canadian Consortium's doing looking at sleep health in older adults, and work tracking the sleep EEG of Parkinson's patients in their own home with and without their DBS stimulator turned on. So in addition to the applications that we create, third-party developers and other companies 
also create on applications on top of Muse. Applications like cognitive training games, neurofeedback applications like from MindLift, brain-based musical selection apps, art experiences that morph with your brain waves, grade school and high school education tools like eegedu.com, and immersive VR experiences that use your EEG to change a virtual environment, like Helium. Now, this has created a meaningful interplay between consumer use of neurotechnology tools and scientific research. So once you have consumers with an EEG in their home, using it in a variety of settings and applications, when it's being worn correctly, you can actually start to learn about the brain and aspects of the brain's activity in our daily lives. This opens up a whole field of distributed neuroscience, bringing EEG out of the lab at scale. There have been over 200 scientific papers published using Muse, with thousands of scientists using Muse to track brain activity in real-world settings. Scientists have seen aspects of what the brain looks like while walking out in nature. They've predicted stroke in the ER in three minutes or less, and two different labs have done this with Muse. Or, like Dr. Olaf Krigolson, they've seen what happens in the brain the moment before a baseball player hits the ball. Now, this feedback goes from scientists back to technologists, allowing them to build even better neurotechnology tools and applications. Having low-cost, accessible neurotech also allows for the democratization of access to scientific technology. Muse has been used to track brain health in children in rural Malawi. It's gone into rural areas of India. And Muse's sleep technology is being taken into low socioeconomic status homes in rural Georgia and native communities in Canada's north. It's also been used by populations that wouldn't normally tolerate a full-cap EEG, like children with autism, uh, in a study with Bristol, and testing it with elderly patients with mild cognitive impairment uh, with Baycrest Hospital, or delivering neurofeedback interventions to Parkinson's patients, like the University of Rhode Island and Baycrest will be doing. And we can do this not on the scale of single individuals with a single time point in the lab, but a large scale, to the order of thousands of individuals, with data taken at multiple time points throughout the day, for days or weeks, or even years. And what you lose in sensor number or imperfect conditions, you make up for in volumes of data. And in the same way that large language models can be used with an AI, we're pioneering the creation of large brain models. And the scientific insights that can be created from those kinds of approaches are staggering. So recently, our group published a paper looking at brain activity during meditation and sleep. We used an AI approach on our large brain database, and we were able to find neuromarkers that correlated brain performance with biological age. One neuromarker we identified was the change, the precise change in alpha peak frequency with age. And in sleep, we were able to see novel correlates in uh, the N2 sleep stage. And we're able to generate these novel insights because we could query the EEG of 5,200 people who'd consented to contribute their de-identified aggregated sensor data for scientific research. And thanks to our unique long, uh, longitudinal data set, we have data from some individuals for hundreds of days in succession. So this also opens up the whole field of citizen science. When people have real scientific tools in their own hands, which they already own and they use regularly, they can choose to participate in validated scientific studies and ask or que answer questions that would have been previously scientifically prohibitive. And of course, this all has to happen within the context of proper privacy, safety, and consent. Rights and policy are critically important. This is human data. And it has to be used to further enable us, not reduce our human agency or cognitive liberty. It has to be approached with the appropriate guards of safety and data privacy by design. We are on the cusp of knowing about the brain. 
And this technology can help us further enable our self-discovery, our cognitive function, and self-regulation. There are many uses for it, and proper regulation will allow it to thrive. And bit by bit, step by step, allow us to move beyond the limitations of our current knowledge. Thank you.